So let me ask you today, how many of you at one point in your life learned to play an instrument? Boy, look at that, people all over the auditorium. I thought about just randomly asking someone to come up and play something, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. How many of you at some time in your life learned to play a sport? Uh, boy, look, boy, boy, we have quite a talented congregation, all right? I know I'm gonna hit the younger crowd right now. How many of you at one point in your life learned to master a video game? Why is everybody whose hand is up under 30 years of age? I'm not exactly sure. Why doesn't anybody my age have their hand up that you learned to master a video game? Well, here's the idea. To be good or even proficient at something it demands practice, isn't that right? When you learn to play an instrument, you had to what? You had to practice that instrument. When you were learning to play a sport, you had to practice that sport. There would be practices that you would have to go to. And quite frankly, when you learn to play a video game, you had to practice. Now, it might not have seemed like practice to you. You were playing and you were having fun. But the more you played, the more you practiced it, the better that you got. Um, if you were here last Sunday, you were able to witness my unbelievable piano talents. If you haven't... Uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm sure it's up on our webpage, and I would encourage you to go to it. Somebody actually filmed it last week, and Vicki said, Brian, you ought to send that film, uh, that video to your mom and dad so they could see you playing. I thought, you know what, they, play, they paid for lessons for seven years. They would be quite discouraged to see that that's all that their money got after seven years of uh, paying for me to take lessons. Listen, to get good at something, you got to practice it, right? I remember when I was uh, a kid, I was so jealous at people that could move different parts of their face, all right? I, remember, uh, I remember when I was like 12 years old, there were kids that could wiggle their ears. I'm not talking about like this. I'm talking about without their hands, they could just stand there and move their ears. Can anybody do that in our congregation? All right, we do have several. I'm not gonna bring you up front to do that, but some of you, some of you can say you can do that. And this is the honest truth. I would stand in front of the mirror and I would concentrate to try to move my ears. And I practiced it over and over again and I never learned how to do it. Or how about the people that can raise one eyebrow? You know, people can just raise one eyebrow, all right? Um, I can't do that either. I mean, I would sit there in front of the mirror and, you know, I'd... And for some reason, I would always tilt one side of my face and try to get that, that other eyebrow to move up. And, and I could never do it. I practiced it, but I never got good enough. And I don't want to gross anybody out, but you ever see anybody who, who wiggled their nose? They just kind of can move, I have no idea how you can control the muscles on your nose, but, but people that would, that, that would move the muscles on their nose. And so I, I'm not lying, I would stand in front of a mirror and I would try to move the muscles on my nose. I practiced and practiced and practiced and never got good enough. So those are talents that I cannot brag about today. We understand, we understand that with enough practice, for the most part, you and I can become good at anything, all right? We might not become professional, we might not become experts at it, but we can become good at it. Now, I say that because if we're not careful, it's easy for us to carry that way of thinking over into our spiritual life. In other words, we can tend to believe that being a strong, successful Christian is just a matter of practice. If I practice more, if I just do better, if I try to do more, the more I practice being a Christian, the better that I can become, right? Wrong. <laughs> 
wrong. If that's, if that's your view today of the Christian life, sitting back saying, boy, I just got to do better, and, and this year I'm going to do better. Now listen, I, I'm not taking away from the fact that, that spiritual disciplines are important. You and I must spend time in God's Word each and every day. You and I must spend time in prayer. We need to practice those spiritual disciplines. But quite frankly, we can never be good enough. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to have this mindset that one day, if I practice enough, I'm going to begin to live in a way that God is going to be thrilled with what I am doing. Well, here in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is addressing people that had that mindset, people who believed that. I would remind you that we are studying the Sermon on the Mount. Our theme for our study is called Flipped. And the the idea being that, that God desires to take the way that we look at life, the way that we look at spiritual things, and literally flip it. To turn it upside down. To cause us to think differently. That's what Jesus did to the religious crowd of his day. As we're going to begin seeing today, they had one idea as to how they should respond and how they should live. And Jesus literally flipped that. He, he, he turned it upside down. He, as we'll see in just a few moments, he raised the bar. And he said, no, it's not what you think it is. It's something completely Different. And so let's read our passage of scripture today in Matthew chapter 5, just three verses. Matthew chapter 5, actually four verses 17, 18, 19, and 20. I'll put it up on the screen. I trust that you have your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, and um, you follow along. I'm reading out of the ESV today, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Jesus says, Don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you that until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot. Your translation might say, not a jot, not a tittle. We'll explain what that means in just a moment. Not an iota, not a dot. will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Man, what a sobering thought. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Notice verse 20. It is so key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes, and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's a rough verse, is it not? Never is a difficult word. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus says you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray together. Lord, these have been difficult verses to comprehend this week. Only you know the amount of time that we've spent in prayer over these verses, trying to understand them. Lord, I want to be so honest and so true to what you intend to say through these verses. So Lord, I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would be our great teacher. Lord, I pray that that my mouth, Lord, would just be a, a tool that you can use to speak your word today, to explain it. Help us to understand it. Help us to realize that all we need is Jesus. And in Jesus, we have everything we need. Lord, help us to understand that, to grasp that truth. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I'd remind you that Jesus was speaking, obviously, to his disciples, but many of his comments were directed toward the religious elite in his day, people that were called the, uh, the scribes 
and the Pharisees. And obviously there were other groups, Sadducees as well, but, but the scribes and the Pharisees were, in their minds, this religious elite group. And they believed that their entrance into the kingdom of heaven was guaranteed. They believed it was guaranteed for two reasons. First of all, they believed it was guaranteed because of their nationality. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, they would say, hey, we are Jews. We are God's chosen people. The rest of the world is on the outside. We're on the inside. The rest of the world has been rejected. We have been accepted by God. So they would think because of their nationality that they were already in, in other words. The the other reason why they thought that their entrance was guaranteed was because of their religiosity. That might be a word that I made up. I'm not sure, but, but, but but they were religious. In other words, it's what I was talking about just a few moments ago. They had become very good at religion. I mean, they... They practiced it. They not only knew what the the Old Testament scriptures taught, but they had memorized many passages in the Old Testament scriptures. They not only knew all the various laws of the Old Testament, but they had added laws on top of laws. And so they not only had the laws that the Bible gave, but then they added layer after layer after layer of laws on top of that, trying to become more and more religious. And so it's to these people that Jesus directs his words. And Jesus shares with them and with us, as the message transcends time, that the way to please God is not to become good at being a Christian. As a matter of fact, I kind of want this phrase to sink into your mind and your heart today because you and I can never be good enough. Catch that today. You can never be good enough. You might sit back and say, oh, hold on, Brian, man. You, I know that's true for a lot of people, but I grew up in church. I mean, when I was two weeks old, I was in church, and uh, I knew all the songs. As a matter of fact, the old hymnals, you tell me the page number, and I'll tell you what hymn is on that page number, all right? I had, anybody grew up in churches? I, and I had this. I had, the, I had the, the pins of all the years for faithful attendance, like 10 years of faithful attendance. Man, Brian, that might be true for a lot of people, but, man, it might not be true for me. Listen, if that's your mindset today, with all due respect, you're wrong. Because the Bible does not encourage us to become better and better and better and more proficient at being a Christian. What that leads to is what the scribes and the Pharisees had. That, That leads to a spiritual hierarchy in which I feel like I'm better than you. I'm more religious than you. You say, Brian, if it's not in getting better, what is it? It's all in depending upon Jesus. Remember how Jesus began the Beatitudes? He says this, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we talked about the poor in spirit are not those who stick out their chest and are able to brag about their accomplishments, but the poor in the spirit are those who are desperate for God. Those who realize that without God, they just cannot make it. Regardless of how many years they've been a believer, regardless of how many spiritual degrees that they have, The simple truth is that you and I need Jesus. We actually need less success, and we need more Jesus in our lives. Now, now, as Jesus taught in these verses, there's just a couple of things that I want to pull together, and I want to be honest and transparent. We have struggled with this passage of Scripture this week. Um, I have rewritten this message four times this week. My first time might have been the best. My second time might have been the best. You're stuck with the fourth time, all right? And um, 
Jose in, in Encuentro, our Spanish ministry, has struggled with it as well. And so, man, man, we really, before God, have tried to synthesize and summarize what these verses are saying. And, to, and so the best of my ability, you can follow along uh, in your outline today. The first thing we see is this, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Now notice in verse 17 what Jesus says. He said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. Rather, I have come to fulfill them. Now let's pause for a second because I think it's so important that we define some of the terms that Jesus is using in the passage. The first is the term law. Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish the law. Rather, I've come to fulfill the law. So when he talks about the law, what does he mean? Well, the Jews, when they use the term law, they actually could mean four different things. First of all, they use the term law at times to refer to the Ten Commandments. All right, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, You know, um, you should be kind to your pastor all the time. You know, those those Ten Commandments that are there that you know and have, have memorized. And so they would use the term law referring to the Ten Commandments. They also use the term law referring to the Pentateuch which are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The term law was also used in reference to the entire Old Testament at times. And so when they refer to the law, at times they would refer to the entire Old Testament, and the term law was also used in reference to all of these extra-biblical rabbinical teachings that they had, what their rabbis would teach, at times they would call it a law. And so the question for us is this, when Jesus speaks of the law, to what part of scripture is he referring and there's one word that helps us to understand that Jesus said I have not come to abolish the law and so the article before the word law helps us to understand that we believe that Jesus is speaking of the first five books of the Bible the Pentateuch the Torah Jesus is saying, I haven't come to abolish the law, those first five books, nor have I come to abolish the prophets, and the term prophets, we believe, is used there for the rest of the Old Testament. And so Jesus is saying, man, I have not come to do away with the Old Testament. Let me ask one more question before we proceed, and and I believe this question is in your outline. So if Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, um, what was, what is the purpose of the law. I think all of us, many of us at least, would, would admit that certain parts of the first five books of the Bible are the most difficult for us to read and understand, right? I don't think there's anybody, if I was a betting man, I'm not, but if I was a betting man, I'd probably put down a pretty hefty bet that nobody here would say, oh, the book of Leviticus is my favorite book of the Bible, Oh, I just can't get enough of the book of Leviticus. I just absolutely love it, all right? Now, now if that's your favorite book, please come and talk to me at the conclusion of the service because I've never met anybody who would say that the book of Leviticus is their favorite book, all right? All of those books, some, to some degree, we struggle with. So what is the purpose of the law? Well, there's, there are a lot of purposes, and I don't. there's no way that I can synthesize them into two uh, but I'm going to try, all right? All right, two reasons, the purpose of the law. First of all, the law demonstrates God's holiness. It's important for us to realize the law demonstrates God's holiness, and we could show verse after verse in the Old Testament, specifically the law, that alluded to the fact that God is holy, and I would encourage you one day to read through the book of Leviticus, not concentrating on each of those specific laws, but reading it as an overview, and you'll walk away saying, boy, why did God put all of those regulations in place? And the reason is because God is holy. And God saw it necessary to emphasize his holiness. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. You see, the rules, the regulations, and the commands of those books demonstrate that our God is holy, that our God is righteous, that our God is just, 
in all his ways. Catch this. There is a standard for morality. Let me say that again. There is a standard for morality. You say, Brian, what is the standard? God is the standard. God is the standard for morality. To reject moral attributes, which is what our society is doing today, to reject moral attributes or to reject the moral attributes of the Bible is to reject the God of the Bible because God is holy. And we see that in the law. There's a second purpose of the law. The law not only demonstrates the holiness of God, but the law also demonstrates the sinfulness of man. The law demonstrates that God is holy and that you and I aren't. (laughs) All right, the law demonstrates that we are so different. We are so distinct from God. Let me show you how the apostle Paul describes that in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Paul says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So so the law what? It demonstrates not only that God is holy, but the law demonstrates that you and I are sinners. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, Paul says, What shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, thou shalt not covet. So, So here's a question. How do we know that lying is wrong? Because the Bible says that lying is wrong. How do we know that stealing is wrong? You might sit back and say, well, duh, Brian, common sense, all right? It's somebody else's property. But how do we know that? Because that standard was marked out in God's word. Thou shalt not steal. How do we know that idolatry is wrong, that adultery is wrong, that covetousness is wrong? Because God's word tells us that those things in the law, God's word tells us that those things displease So the law demonstrates, Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. The law demonstrates, Romans 3.23, that all of us are sinners and have fallen short of God's glory. All right, so now back to our text. Jesus says, so I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. I've kind of put that phrase right in your notes. Jesus did not come to abolish, but Jesus came to accomplish. Jesus did not come to abolish, but to accomplish. This is such an important statement for us to understand. We, we live in a day in which the law is minimized and set aside. Uh, many parts of the Bible, you've heard this All right, whether you've recognized it or not, many parts of the Bible today are treated as irrelevant. Many parts of the Bible are treated as out of date and not applicable to us. All right? Not Brian's words, Jesus' words. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. The word abolish has the idea of overthrowing, to destroy, to tear it down, to smash it up. Here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that the New Testament does not nullify the Old Testament. Many people view the Old Testament as Bible version 1.0, and the New Testament is Bible version 2.0. And now that Bible version 2.0 has come out, there's no reason for me to pay attention to Bible version 1.0. Why? Because we have the updated model. That's not what Jesus is saying in his word. Jesus is saying he didn't come to abolish the Old Testament. He came to fulfill. The word fulfill in the passage has the idea of to complete, to accomplish what is already present is the idea. Here, let me try to illustrate. Um, Vicki loves to put together puzzles. 
All right, so, so every Christmas, Vicky buys a puzzle, like a 500-piece puzzle or a 1,000-piece puzzle or a, you know, 20,000-piece puzzle or something like that. And so, you know, during Christmas, I don't see Vicky that often because she's in working on the puzzle and I'm doing something else. I'm not a puzzle person. And so every once in a while, I'll come in and put one or two pieces down just so I can say, we did the puzzle together, all right? <laughs> She did 498 pieces, I did two pieces, all right? Or she did 998 pieces, I did two pieces. So, so imagine it's on Christmas morning and Vicky's almost put together the entire puzzle. And she, there, there's five pieces remaining and she decides, you know what, it's one o'clock in the morning because she does. She stays up really late working on puzzles. And so, and so uh, it's when she said, you know what, I'm going to leave those five pieces till the morning and I'm going to get up in the morning and put those five pieces in and complete the puzzle. Well, I get up before Vicky does. And so I get up and I see, oh my word, there's five more pieces. I can figure this out, all right? It takes me a lot longer than her, but I find a place for all five of those pieces. And I do what? I finish the puzzle. I complete the puzzle. I accomplish it. Now catch me. I don't bring in, well, you know what? I don't think those five pieces are what we need. I'm gonna go and get five pieces from another puzzle and bring them in here. I use what? I use the pieces that are already there. And using the pieces that are there, I what? I accomplish the puzzle. I fulfill it. I complete it. That's the idea of the word that Jesus uses. Jesus is saying, I did not come to abolish the law. Rather, I have come to fulfill it. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am taking what is already present in the Old Testament and I am accomplishing what is present. I'm not doing away with all of that and starting all over. It's not like I wake up on Christmas morning and say, this is crazy, there's only five pieces left and let's toss this aside and start a brand new puzzle. All right, Vicki would divorce me if that would happen, all right? I, Jesus isn't saying, boy, you know what? Boy, this puzzle just isn't right. Let's do away with it, and let's start a new puzzle that we're going to call the New Testament. That's not what Jesus does. He takes what is already there, and he fulfills it. He completes it. He accomplishes it. He finishes it. Let me give you several ways that Jesus does that. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. How does he fulfill the law? First of all, he fulfills scripture, the law, with his perfect life. With his perfect life. All of those Old Testament commands, all of those rules and regulations that the nation of Israel could not complete, that actually condemned them, guess what? Jesus fulfilled them. Jesus obeyed every single one of them. You said, Brian, are you mean to tell me that Jesus never violated not a single one of the Ten Commandments? That's exactly what I'm saying. Jesus never lied. Jesus never committed idolatry. Jesus never committed adultery. Jesus never stole. Jesus never dishonored his parents. Jesus fulfilled every aspect of of the Ten Commandments, and not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the Old Testament law. He perfectly fulfilled it. He did not violate one of those commands. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that if you violate one, you violated what? All of them. So if Jesus would have just violated one, he would have been guilty of all, but he never did. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so Jesus perfectly fulfills the law by his perfect life. Secondly, he fulfills scripture with his perfect sacrifice. Oh man, we could camp here and park for weeks on end. For hundreds of years, the Jews had offered sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. 
As a matter of fact, Josephus and other historians tell us that specifically during the Passover, the streets of Jerusalem were filled with running blood for the amount of sacrifices that were made over and over and over again, year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice was made. Each sacrifice temporarily appeasing God. But soon they'd have to have another sacrifice. Why is that? Hebrews 10, 4 says this. Notice this verse in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Um, do we have verse 4? Did I not put verse 4 up there? Shoot, I didn't put verse 4. Here's verse 4, all right? For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Let me say It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So, Brian, what did those sacrifices accomplish? They only appeased God for just a few moments. They were just a temporary covering for just a a few days, a few weeks, a year, until another sacrifice was made. But then Jesus, Jesus comes on the scene. The perfect sacrifice who had fulfilled all of the Old Testament commands, all of the rules and regulations without a single sin. And Jesus makes a one-time forever payment for our sins. Here's what 1014 of Hebrews said. For by a single offering, He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You ever wonder why when we come to church on Sunday morning, we don't have an altar down front and we say, okay, Gil, it's you guys' turn to bring the lamb. You bring the lamb this Sunday and Marty, you bring it next Sunday and Timothy, you bring it the Sunday after that and we every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday, we're offering sacrifices. You ever wonder why we don't do that today? Here's why we don't do it, because we don't have to. Because Jesus was the perfect sacrifice who fulfilled completely, accomplished, completed the righteous demands of the law. He completely fulfilled it in himself as the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. I read that. Here's what I wrote in my notes. Wow. No more sacrifices No more blood. Jesus paid it all. Once and forever, he paid the sacrifice for our sins. And he perfectly fulfilled the demands of the Old Testament. There's a third thing that I wrote. And this is actually what I think he's meaning in the passage. Is Jesus fulfills scripture as the living word. You see, he not only perfectly fulfilled it by his life, he not only fulfilled it by his perfect sacrifice, but Jesus is the living word. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Jesus is the law. Jesus is the word of God. John chapter one and verse one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what? It was God. Who is John 1, 1 talking about? It's talking about none other than Jesus Christ. Verse 14 of that same chapter says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became one of us. He moved into our neighborhood. And so when Jesus says, man, I have come not to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. Jesus could look at them and say, in front of your very eyes today, The Old Testament law is fulfilled. It's accomplished. It's completed in me. I've come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus says a second thing. Let's kind of move along in the passage. Jesus says, every part of Scripture will be accomplished. Notice in verse verse 18, he says, For truly I say to you, 
until heaven and earth pass away. Not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The phrase heaven and earth pass away speaks of the end of time as we know it, all right? As, as, as earthly time comes to an end, not a single aspect of the scripture will not be fulfilled. The word iota stands for the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet. And dot or tittle, depending upon what version that you have, literally means a stroke. It, it, it actually means the little horn. It speaks of small marks that distinguish one Hebrew letter from another. We have, we have folks in here that have taken Hebrew. You can ask them. It's, it, it's not really a letter, but it's a small mark that distinguishes one letter from another. So, so what is Jesus saying? Here's what Jesus is saying. Not even the smallest most insignificant part of God's word will be removed or modified until what? Until all of it has been accomplished. That's what Jesus is saying. He says a third thing. He says every part of scripture is applicable to the believer. Notice notice the next verse. In verse 19, he says, the ESV says, therefore whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments. I know we have different translations. If you have the King James, the King James says, for whoever breaks one of these commandments. The NASB says, whoever annuls one of these commandments. The NIV says, whoever sets it aside. Whoever takes one of these commandments and sets them aside shall be treated as least in the kingdom of heaven. The Jews in Jesus' day had divided the Old Testament law into two categories. They had, they, had, they had counted them up. There were 248 positive commands, and there were 365 negative commands. One negative command for each day. Uh, you, know, you can calendarize the negative commands. One for each day of the year. The religious leaders spent hours debating which were the most important of those commands and which commands were the least important important. You say, man, Brian, what conclusion did they come to? Which ones are the most important and which ones are the least important? Well, uh, I don't have that information at least. Here's what I believe is taking place. The simple truth is that while some commands are more important than others, none are to be disregarded. All of God's word is relevant for us. But but, but I want to say that again because it, it might not be the most important thing I say this morning, but it's true. It's so important. All of God's word is relevant for us. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? I'm saying that you can grab your Bible and it doesn't matter what book of the Bible you go to. You open it and you read that book of the Bible. You can have full assurance that God is speaking to you. Here's what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. You guys know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, all right? But I do know what the word all means. <laughs> All scripture is given by God. What does it mean? All scripture. All 66 books are inspired by God. All 66 books God can use to speak to our heart. I'd encourage you, do not be afraid of the Old Testament. Don't don't cast it aside. Don't disregard it as if, oh, that was written for a different time and a different place, and it doesn't apply to us. All of God's word is applicable to us. I wish I had so much more time to delve into that. I don't. I will be blogging about that in the next few weeks. Here's what I want us to see from the passage. It's this. Jesus is the fulfillment of, of the Old Testament scriptures. That's what Jesus is saying. Now here's the second thing, and this is even, I believe, more important in the passage. The second thing that we see in these four verses is this. 
Jesus raises the bar for New Testament believers. Not only is he the fulfillment of the Old Testament, but Jesus raises the bar for New Testament believers. Verse 20 is an extremely important verse. And most Bible teachers say that it's the key to understanding the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And some would go so far as to say that it's the key to understanding the rest of the New Testament. So what does Jesus say in verse 20? Here's what he says. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is Jesus saying? When he looks at those listeners and he looks at us and he says, unless, Brian, unless you are more righteous than those scribes and Pharisees that had laws and laws on top of laws and laws on top of laws, unless you are more righteous than they are, you will never inherit the kingdom of heaven. What is Jesus saying? That we have to keep more rules than the scribes and the Pharisees? Oh my word, they were keeping so many rules. Okay, we got to count how many rules they were keeping, and we need to keep more than them. Is he saying we have to work harder than they did? Because they worked really hard at being religious. Now, they were religiously egotistical, but they worked very hard at being religious. Is Jesus saying, unless you work harder than the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God? Or is Jesus saying, unless you're more spiritual than they are, you will not inherit the kingdom of God? The answer to that is a resounding no. That's not what Jesus is saying. Listen, all of us, let's breathe a collective sigh of relief. All right? Because they couldn't keep all of the rules that they had. So there's no way that you and I say, okay, we're just going to keep more rules than they kept. It's impossible. That's not what Jesus is saying in the passage. Let me give you two, two simple summary statements, and we'll try to wrap this up and say this in a way that, that is honest to the passage and honors Jesus. The first is this. We need, to, we need to understand that you and I are no longer under law. We are under grace. Amen. We are no longer under the law. We're under grace. You say, Brian, what does that mean? You see, the Pharisees and the, and the Jewish leaders had slavishly and unsuccessfully attempted to fulfill all of the demands of the Old Testament law. As we've seen the law, Paul described it as like a chain around their foot. I mean, the more they tried, the more they were wrapped up in that chain. And they tried and tried to be religious, but the more they tried, the more unsuccessful they were. The law, they couldn't keep it. And the law constantly reminded them of their failure. But then Jesus came. Jesus came, he lived, he died, and he rose again. Catch this. And he freed us from the penalty of sin. And he freed us from the condemnation of the law. That's why we can sing, my chains, they're gone. I have been set free I'm not only free from my sins, but I'm free from the righteous demands of the law that I could not fulfill. You say, oh my word, Brian, do you say what I think you're saying? That we no longer have to obey all of those commands. We don't have to worry about them. No, that's not what I'm saying. (laughs) Today we obey God's word, not out of fear. But today we obey God's word out of joy. Today, we obey God's word not with a dread of condemnation that, oh my, what if I don't fulfill this aspect? Or or what if I fall over here? What if I'm trying to do my best and, and I fail at what I'm trying to do? No, today we obey God's word not with a fear and dread of condemnation, but today we obey God's word out of love. We obey God's word out of appreciation for everything that he has done for us. You see, today, we live in the realm of grace. 
We live in the realm of God's grace. No one is perfect, beginning with me. I would love to stand and tell you today, well, you know what, since last Sunday till now, I haven't committed one sin. (laughs) Not one the past seven days. But I'd be lying. Because I blow it just like you do. And I am so grateful for the fact that when I sin, I don't have to worry about the judgment of God coming down on me. Why? Because Jesus already took that judgment. So much so that Paul said in Romans 8, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus already took it all. He already was paid for my sin. Today, you and I live in the realm of grace. We're in desperate need of God's grace. Do you understand that today? I am in desperate need of God's grace. And I don't know all of you today, but I do know you well enough to know this. You are in desperate need of God's grace today. Where would we be without God's grace? So, how does that tie in with what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20? Because Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Let me, let me say this. Grace does not reduce God's expectations. Grace raises Grace does not reduce God's expectations. It raises them. So many present-day believers act as if the demands of God's holiness have been loosed, as if all, all of those moral obligations of the Old Testament, that's just old-fashioned, fuddy-duddy stuff. We don't need to obey. We don't need to be righteous. All of that stuff, we live by grace. So because we live by grace, we basically can do what we want and then ask forgiveness for it. Did you ever have an employee or someone that say, hey, you know what, do what you want and just ask forgiveness later? Sometimes I think that's the way we live our Christian lives. Ah, you know what, Jesus paid for it. I can do what I want. 1 John 1, 9. I do not believe that's what grace entails. You see, grace doesn't reduce God's expectations. It raises them. You say, Brian, is that clear? It is so clear in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. As a matter of fact, starting next Sunday, here's what Jesus is going to say. In verse 21, we start with this next Sunday. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said. And he quotes a part of the Old Testament law. But then Jesus says, but I say to you. Jesus said, here's what you were taught. Guess what? I'm not lowering the bar. I'm what? I'm raising the bar. All right. Adultery. Hey, adultery. Yeah, I know what adultery is. It's being with a woman who's not my wife. Jesus says, yeah, it was. But Jesus says, now if you look at a woman and you lust after her, you have committed adultery in your heart. Jesus raises the bar. Now, now listen, here's where I'm going. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. You say, I don't get it then, Brian. What's the difference between Old Testament believers and New Testament believers? What's the difference? I feel like I'm still under bondage. What's the difference between God's expectation then, God's expectation now? Here's the difference. Catch this. This is so important. Here's the difference. The difference is Jesus. The difference is Jesus. You see, you and I cannot be more righteous. We can never be good enough. We can't practice our spirituality enough. We can't practice our Christianity enough. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't live righteous and holy and all of that. But it's not a matter of just going by a list of here's the things I do and here's the things I shouldn't do. That's legalism. Today we sit back and say, listen, I love 
God, I love Jesus with all of my heart for what he has done for me. And God, by your help and by your empowerment, I am going to live a life that honors you. And if I fall, I realize that a righteous man falls, but he gets back up. And I realize that the forgiveness of God is available to me and the power of God is available to me. And today, I want to be an, a believer that honors you, not because of what I do, but because of what you do in me. Paul said it this way, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So, so write this statement down. I didn't put it in your outline. Write this statement down. This is, this is the key that I want you to catch, the key today. The only way that you can please God is through Jesus Christ. The only way that you can please God is through Jesus Christ. Would you say that with me today? Let's change the pronouns from you to I. Would you say that with me today? The only way that I can please God is through Jesus Christ. Would you say that with me again? The only way that I can please God is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my victory. Jesus is my companion. Jesus helps me to be and become who God wants me to be. So what does that mean? I better stay pretty close to Jesus. I better stay close to him. Because the farther away from him that I move, the less I please God. You see, it's all about Jesus. It would be so much easier if I could just give you, and sometimes people ask me for that. So new, new believers come and they'll say, Brian, would you give me a list of things that I'm supposed to do and things that I'm not supposed to do? And it'd be so easy if I could say, oh, I'd, I'd be glad to. Here's the list of what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. The Bible doesn't give that. What's he, he, wants us, he wants us to be connected to Jesus. And the more connected I am to Jesus Christ, the more I realize what offends him and what sins dishonor him and what sins disobey him. And my life is now surrounded around the fact that I want to please Jesus. So every day of my life, I run to Jesus. I run to him and I ask him for the strength and the power and the forgiveness that I need to get me through today. And here's the cool thing. The more time I spend with Jesus, the more I become like him. Did you ever look at a couple that had been married for years and years and think, they look like each other? I mean, you're like, that guy marry his sister? I mean, good grief. They, they look like each other. They, they have the same mannerisms. They have all of that kind of stuff. Now, here's the idea. I mean, there's no sibling marriage that's going on there. They've just spent so much time together that they become like each other. You see, my goal is to spend so much time with Jesus that I become like him. That chorus I used to sing as a little boy. To be like Jesus, to be like him. Oh, my desire to be like Jesus. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And by the way, he's the fulfillment of the New Testament as well. He's not just the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And Jesus raises the bar for us. Except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Well, your righteousness can never exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, and my can't either, but Jesus's can. And I claim his righteousness for my life. 